to see if there are specific tools that could be applied for use here in Alaska. And I'll stop to see if anyone, council member that attended wants to comment. To see if there's specific tools that could be applied for use here in Alaska. I guess so. when I say something important, apparently it gets repeated. <laughs> Mr. Witherall. Okay, uh, consistent with our uh, uh, public comment policy, I am reporting that there were no uh, submitted comments that were removed from our list due to being inconsistent with the policy. I have an announcement that the Alaska Sea Life Center has announced the nominations are open for the 2023 Ocean Leadership Awards, and those nominations are open through December 12th, and there's some instructions uh, on a flyer attached to the B1 item. I review some of the st staff and council member activities and committee meetings in my report, and I note that there are several upcoming events that uh, are occurring this week and into the next couple of months, including executive session on Friday. There's a flyer for an event on Monday, um, December 12th at the museum on discussion of boom or bust in the Bering Sea. That's a panel discussion. Um, you may want to attend that. The IPHC meeting is scheduled for January 23rd to 27th. Uh, there is a, uh, a round table on Alaska, on Alaska sanctuary nominations being hosted by the uh, NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, a date has not been set on that, and I'll, I'll keep you informed as the more I, details I hear about that round table, but uh, that is being planned to allow the public uh, to make comments to the Alaska congressional delegation, uh, NOAA and others to learn about the meet, about these nominations. Uh, the SSC is hosting a workshop in February on rapid change in the Northern Bering Sea and Southern Chukchi Sea. There's a flyer for that, and that will be held in conjunction with our February meeting in Seattle. Uh, we're hoping to um, have participation from council members and even advisory panel members when they start talking about how to uh, make changes to our management system during that workshop. Uh, there's a flyer for Comfish Alaska to be held in March in Kodiak, and that's attached. Um, there's also a notice that the Marine Resource Econ Education Program that you learned about um, back in June uh, is launching a program in the Pacific region. Uh, and that first workshop is scheduled for April 17th to 21. Uh, the, that's free to participants and uh, seats are limited. So uh, there's some information there for those uh, fishermen that would like to attend that uh, MREP program. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, um, the North Pacific Research Board uh, will present one of the short films about the Arctic Integrated Ecosystem Research Program that Mr. Mesereau mentioned at our last meeting. And rather than talk about it, I'm gonna let Dr. Lynn Polanski and uh, Brendan Smith come up to the table and, and uh, pre present us with some information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. And good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and good morning, council members. Um, for the record, my name is Lynn Polanski, Executive Director of the North Pacific Research Board here in Anchorage. With me is Brendan Smith, our Communications and Outreach Director. We're here to share the Arctic Coastal Communities video that was recently produced at the completion of the Arctic Integrated Ecosystem uh, Research Program, or otherwise known as IERP, you probably heard of that. The video is about seven minutes long. I'll provide some context for the Arctic IERP, and then I'll turn it over to Brendan to further highlight the community engagement aspects of this program and to also give the video a proper introduction. So the big question that we sought to address in this Arctic IERP was how will reductions in Arctic sea ice and the associated changes in the physical environment influence the flow of energy through the ecosystem in the Chukchi Sea? To address this question, it was gonna require a lot of people, a lot of collaboration, a lot of money and a lot of time. So this was an $18 million program that included support from BOEM, the North Slope Borough Shell Baseline Studies Program, 
the Office of Naval Research, NOAA, and University of Alaska Fairbanks spanning from 2016 to 2021 and a lot of Arctic communities. They had several field seasons starting in 2017 to 2019. Over 50 scientists worked collaboratively across disciplines um, that included biological, physical, oceanographic, chemical aspects to look at how climate change how climate changes overall impact the species that coastal communities depend on in this area, marine mammals, marine birds, and fish. And we also had members from eight communities um, as far south as Savunga and St. Lawrence Island to Kiagvik, uh, participating in the entire IERP and attended regular um, principal investigator or PI meetings. In September, staff played the video for our panels and our board and our chair, council member Mezzaro, thought it would be timely to share this video with you to illustrate how NPRB has and will continue to include local traditional knowledge, community involvement, and co-production in the programs that NPRB funds. Now, I'll turn it over to Brendan to highlight the community involvement, engagement, and engagement components that actually led to the production of this video. And also, kudos to uh, Brendan, who had a... Uh, uh, a big role in producing the video and actually getting some of this footage. So, thank you, Lynn. Brendan. So, for the Arctic IERP, coastal community involvement was important throughout the entire program. And during the research planning process, for example, MPRB staff and chief scientists set up hub meetings throughout the region, including Nome, Kotzebue, and Utkiavik, to engage with communities and listen to what research priorities were important to them, and then tailor the science and research operations around those community needs. During research operations, we had three Alaska Native research assistants aboard the research vessel Sekuliak and research vessel Ocean, Ocean Star. And we had communicated daily with uh, the communities around the vessel when we were doing ship ops and let the communities know where those vessels were. There was also a significant social science component to the program that involved multiple community members from different communities working together and actively engaging with Arctic IERP scientists. So because of that high level of community involvement, we thought it appropriate to produce a film that illustrated some of those important concepts. Now about this video that you're about to see, it's part of a five part series that NPRB produced to highlight the Arctic IERP program. The other films that we produced were focused on how you actually study an entire ecosystem, an overview of the Arctic program, the research and results that stemmed from the program itself, and then finally a film focusing on the research vessels that the scientists used. The Sekuliak is one of the most sophisticated research vessels in the world, and we thought it appropriate to kind of highlight one of those, film, one of those vessels. Now, for this particular film that you're about to see, there was a little bit more logistics involved. Um, to, to do a film about community involvement uh, required some logistics that required receiving some special permissions. And the footage you're about to see is from the village of Dymed, and we received uh, special permission from the village of Dymed and the Analic Native Corporation, and specifically Opik Akinga, who is featured in the film, granted us permission to document the work that she continues to do for her community that is directly linked to the Arctic IERP, which is great. The North Pacific Research Board and I are sincerely grateful for her contributions, both at sea as an Alaska Native, Marine, Alaska Native Research Assistant and interviewee, and over the years, she's become a quite personal close friend of mine. And so there was just a little bit of pressure to do this video, uh, it's justice. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce this film to you all. My people have always been aware that it's changing and we're having to live around these changes for safety, but then little do they know that these changes are occurring in the ocean and with the warmer temperatures and all of these things that we're finding, we have to be safe during all seasons now. 
now. Like the ice condition, we, we used to have the thick old ice and it was safe and we could go further out and we were mindful, we, we knew it was going to stay and so now we have this new ice where you, we, it's so unpredictable. We wait for the ice to go away so the barges can come in, right, to bring supplies, fuel, that kind of necessary items. Now we have to wait for the waves to come down where, where they can land on ashore. But the thing with the ice being way, way far, right, we, we've started to change our ways to go out sooner and to harvest sooner and come back sooner. When you start having environmental anxiety about your home and that it's not necessarily safe anymore because of things out of your control as far as warming temperatures in the marine ecosystem, it feels like a colossal thing that you just feel the repercussions of but you can't really change. And once you have more information about there's this much concentration of harmful substances in bivalves that we're eating or clams, then you just stop consuming them. You stop going out. You lose that connection with not only that species but with the people that you would do it with. So to me the fascinating thing about a program like the Arctic IERP is drawing together people who are studying so many different aspects of the ecosystem from the physical conditions all the way up to the top trophic levels, the top predators and so on and including the coastal communities. And by getting everybody together thinking about this, we start to be able to see things that are not apparent if you're just looking at, at one piece. I don't know how you could get to that without something like the Arctic IERP, and to me that's the, both the joy and the value of it. Hunters that are, have a lot of knowledge, and also scientists uh, working together collaboratively along with other entities that are local and regional, and a positive example is the IERP. I think those kind of things uh, need to continually progress and to work in a positive way. Opik Akinga of Little Diomede participated in research aboard our cruises during the springtime in 2017 and 2018. She's continuing to engage in science in her community, doing things like harmful algal bloom monitoring and crab monitoring. I'm Opeka Kinga. I'm the environmental coordinator with the native village of Daimi. And I'm super thankful for having that opportunity to be on Sequiliac because everything I experienced on there really helped me to want to do something like this. Because of them and seeing all the different scientists do their remarkable work, I felt like I knew I was going to do something like that. Working so close to scientists and seeing the actual work being done, that was the big like pushed me and say, you know, you gotta do this. Well, I wanna make sure our, our environment is, you know, healthy, land, air, and sea. I mean, we need them to be healthy so we can have healthy crab, you know, healthy seal, healthy walrus. With climate change as it is, warmer waters, and that it's all affecting the marine ecosystem, you know, we wanna be careful. We wanna, we wanna learn how taking in our harvest is treating our human body. You know, and this is just one way to do it, documenting, taking the data, doing the measurements, taking the samples, getting them tested, receiving the results and sharing with the community. That needs to be done. Equity is very important, very key for communicating with our indigenous people, not just in Alaska, but um, circumpolarly. But where those interactions are really productive, when people have that sense of a shared interest and commitment, you know, a detailed understanding, and crucially, respect for one another. I can't tell an Arctic coastal community leader what matters to him or her. I can provide information for them to digest, for them to put it together with everything else going on in their world, and figure out where priorities should be. And I think that's an important thing that could be done in, in future IERPs, is to think very carefully about that process of not just gathering and analyzing information, but how we distill it into, into action, and how that's being done in coastal communities, and how we can support them as they're doing it. Having that community involvement piece, making sure that what we're doing as scientists is also representative of community research priorities, that it's actually included in the management process and the research process. 
because otherwise it doesn't feel like it's relevant or that people coming into my community don't understand the local context. And I think that that's where the, like, the management divide really comes from, is people not thinking that they understand each other. Working together can only lead to a, a positive way. And we also see that there's more interest now from local students that hope to become biologists. The Arctic at ERP made really good progress in engaging Arctic communities in the research at every stage. But I think we can go even further when we engage in our future IERPs to really do research together with the people who will find it the most relevant. I see opportunities for Alaskans to improve IERPs and for our IERPs to provide even greater benefit to Alaska communities. We can work together even more closely to design the research questions and our approach to answering them. Because IERPs facilitate continued collaboration over a number of years, they allow you an opportunity to build the relationships that could allow the use of Western science alongside Indigenous knowledge. When we conducted the Arctic IERP, we really strive to include Arctic community members at every stage, from helping us determine what the important research questions were to involving them in collecting the data and analyzing the information and helping us determine the best ways to get that information back out to communities. And I hope that, that some of the foundations we've laid in the context of the Arctic IERP will allow us to do this even better when we host the next IERP, the one we expect to focus more on the Northern Bering Sea region and really hone in on some of those more significant and rapid changes we've been seeing. In my mind, community health land health, water health, is a web of interconnectedness. And so I feel like this integrated ecosystem project is just coming in alignment with that. Mr. Chair, uh, while the credits are running, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment about the power of film and why we made these, these films to begin with. And Film can really help communicate science in ways that the written word or fact sheets just simply cannot. And videos retain that viewership and unveil a scene much differently than other mediums. And so we saw that opportunity and um, especially for the community involvement piece for the Arctic IERP, we decided to use that footage and, and go out and acquire footage on the village of Diomede to produce this particular video. And <clears throat> Each IERP that NPRB produces has a dedicated funds to support outreach and engagement. And so for the Arctic program, we wanted to create meaningful products, not just outreach products that um, we can say that we spent the money and, and we're done. We wanted to create products that have meaning, that are tangible, and that are all tied to one another and fit into a larger, broader engagement strategy. So these films will be premiered at AEWC, AMSS, and hopefully AFE in the future um, months here. And we have a couple of other things up our sleeves to promote this video as well. And I'm welcome to entertain any questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Smith and Dr. Polensky. Look to Mr. Mizro to see if he has any comments he'd like to add. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, both of you, for your coming over here and doing this, braving the weather. I just thought when I saw that video the first time around that it sort of, if you look at the IERP, it explains how co-production can actually work. And I think going into the hub communities and meeting with people and then taking their opinions and integrating it into the research is exactly the kind of thing that sort of explains how that works. And I think that's kind of been a mystery in the council process because we don't get into the research as much. So I thought it was relevant to spend seven minutes looking at that to kind of see how it all ties together when it all works. And I think one thing to keep in mind is that film was made in 2015, it's 2022 now. We've gotten a lot more familiar with engagement in the last seven years. So I think the next one should be really interesting to see. I guess my only question for them is that you talked a little bit about outreach and uh, I think there's other other sorts of engagement and outreach that NPRB is doing that's relevant to people in the room and on, online, and particularly uh, the project you started with the Anchorage Museum. Do you want to just run and give us a little lowdown on what that plan is for people here in town to check out? Through the chair, if I may. Yeah, so um, I, I kind of did a softball to um, Andy there. The 
one of the bigger engagement strategy pieces for this film, along with the other Arctic IERP engagement pieces that we're producing, uh, is a larger exhibit that we're actually in conversation with right now with the Anchorage Museum. In 2025, we will be producing an Arctic marine science exhibit on the first floor of the exhibit hall in the Anchorage Museum. And what we're hoping to do is recreate the whole research vessel Sekuliak experience so that when visitors are walking through that exhibit space, they're going to feel what it's like to be on a research vessel out at sea. Uh, the other major component to this particular exhibit is that there'll be a traveling component to that as well, where we will create satellite exhibitry that can go to remote communities. And we're exploring virtual reality um, concepts, VR goggles, so that uh, folks in communities can actually feel what it's like to be on the ship, even though they might not be able to get out there. And so it's this connection between rural and urban communities that can experience marine research science and understand the importance of their backyard and, and what it means to them. Um, so we're hoping 2025, we're in conversations right now with the museum and, and we're really looking forward to producing something like this. This is something that MPRB has never done before and um, we're really excited to embark on this. We're also doing, um, making sure that we have a Alaska Native co-partner to produce this as well. And the North Slope Borough and North Slope Shell Baseline Studies Program have agreed to be that um, initial co-production partner for that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mezzaro. Mr. Smith, any questions? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation and the opportunity to see the video. It was wonderful. Um, I, this I'm just seeing this for the first time. So it, is this kind of the summary of, uh, I don't want to say conclusions, but what you saw in the vessel surveys that you did in the Arctic? And then if we wanted to look at the data itself, we would go to a different report. Is, is that what this is used for? Through the chair. Yes, uh, that is a summary of the research findings um, from the program spanning from 2016 to 2021. And those are the 30,000 foot results that you'll see. You can get more information um, online on our website and access the data through the data portal that Axiom manages. Thank you. And then quick follow up for the next uh, iteration, I guess, of the program. Have those research objectives or questions that were mentioned in the video, are those already determined? For the next iteration, the Arctic is complete now. So we're moving into the <clears throat> new IERP and we're at the really early planning stages of it. And that's in the Northern Bering Sea. That's where it's focused. So we're um, we're just starting to meet with community partners and getting the word out and uh, getting partners involved in that. So really early stages, this is going to actually, it started already with a, uh, an assessment of what's out there on the Northern Bering Sea. And then um, over the next, I think, five years, we'll be working on, on this program, on a new program. So those objectives haven't been set yet. We're just, um, again, in the early stages. So we'll be talking more to you and others um, at, at meetings locally and, and around Alaska. Thank you. And I just, yeah, if there's an opportunity, we we get a lot of this kind of the same, I guess, questions or um, push for research in certain areas on certain topics and in the Northern Bering Sea in particular and the Eastern Bering Sea. And if there's any opportunity for this council to help inform that through our public process, I guess we have Mr. Mesro as a contact, but um, I just encourage kind of continued coming to this session and letting us understand where you're going with those. So maybe we can help inform that as well. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. And, and for those online and members of the, the, the public, in Ms. Kimball's first question, she was referring to a, a pamphlet that was handed out to council members. We will also be uh, putting a, a link to that pamphlet on our e-agenda so that, uh, that members of the public can refer to that. Um, further questions, Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, first off, thanks very much to um, all three of you for bringing this and for understanding that um, the value it would have for council members in particular to really sort of have a tangible feel for how this is working. Um, 
so uh, you're well aware that we're um, as a council still in the very early stages in the formative stages of of um, exploring how to integrate uh, how to how to sort of understand and integrate um, LKTK um, with the science that we're very used to working with and it's it seems to us to still be a fairly daunting process that we're really right at the beginning of in many ways i'm wondering from your perspective um how um how difficult were those first steps for you uh, uh were they the sort of thing that just took a lot of time with maybe even a lot of false starts or was it something that once you got started it started to come together more smoothly just some sense of what those first couple of years of of trying to walk down that path felt like uh through the chair um good question um first i just want to say we're de we're definitely that better okay i'm not on now though we're back on okay all right well definitely not the experts here we learn as we go um and hope we're successful and hope we meet the needs and expectations along the way of of everyone so i wasn't around during the beginning of that but um i would say we've learned a lot and i think the key thing for me in my mind is getting out there and talking and building relationships you can't be successful without those so that's the fundamental you know that those are the 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 fundamental building blocks of, of making this successful is encouraging um building the road forming the relationships and asking the questions what's important in your area what's important to you um and going from there and brendan i'll let you fill in on any details specific to um experiences at the time Sure. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, so North Pacific Research Board has had a longstanding commitment to LTK spanning all the way back from 2002 when it was first started. Uh, we had LTK commu committees, um, and then we started infusing um, LTK into the broader context of having our advisory panel committee as well. So it's been an evolving process. Um, as Lynn mentioned, we're not the experts, we're still learning. Um, and I think to be humble is very important in this process. And in particular to this video, I, I couldn't I couldn't do this without the relationship building that had transpired with OPIC and I over the years as she was a research assistant on Sekuliak. And I knew that her story was important to tell. And it was um, important that she was involved in that process. And so uh, involving as much as possible uh, at that community level was paramount for the success for this film and and just for our relationship as well um you know like i mentioned there was a lot of effort that went into this and we wanted to make sure we did it right thank you mr dwight any further questions miss kimball i i just to follow up on my other previous question is there a direct link or do you work with the authors of our ecosystem status reports that are really focused on the bering sea and northern bering sea i just want to ensure that connection is made yes we do we've got a lot of connections with the council and the council staff and on on your committees so yes um actually um danielle or danielle dixon and, and matt baker working with your staff as well as some of the chairs of the committees bob foy on sort of thinking again early thoughts on how to pull this together and give it give it a solid direction so yeah thank you all right thank you miss kimball okay thank you so much dr polensky and mr smith for coming to present with us this morning and mr mesereau for for bringing this forward fantastic job thank you and um thank you uh, mr Rezerau, for including this on your ed report appreciate it thank you yeah, thank you all. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Mr. Wither, I believe that concludes. That concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any questions, Mr. Twight? 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Witherall, I saw in the Seattle Times that um, there's apparently a panel being scheduled for Monday evening at the Anchorage Museum that the Seattle Times, Anchorage Daily News, I think some others are putting on. Uh, I'm wondering, have we, has the council been contacted about that? Do we have any understanding of of what the ability is to either attend or, or have we, do we have a role in that at all? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, uh, Mr. Twight, I, I was um, noticed about that uh, panel discussion that will be held at the museum next Monday, just a couple of days ago. So I didn't have a chance to incorporate it in into my written B1 report, but I did include a flyer that's attached under B1 with the details on how to participate uh, and attend and where it is and what it's about and who the panelists are. You can get it on their website that's listed. But we're not, we, we don't have any role in that, I'm assuming. Not officially, no, Mr. Chairman. Further questions for Mr. Witherall? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Witherall, I don't know how much more you can offer, but I had not heard about the planned roundtable on Alaska sanctuary nominations. And can you just review again who the who's uh, organizing that? And I think you you mentioned the congressional delegation being involved, and just who the anticipated um, participants in that are, just so I. I haven't participated in many roundtables. So can you maybe just review the information you provided to us again? Sure. Um, the Office of National Marine Sanctuary folks uh, were in contract, contact with me and Mr. Curlin relative to uh, hosting a roundtable to discuss those nominations at the request of the Alaska delegation. And so the, the idea would be to um, have presentations from the proposers, um, have a discussion um, about the process for nomination and designation um, of sanctuaries by the sanctuary folks, and then a question and answer period uh, with the public. And I, they've only planned, I believe, two hours. That's what the initial thinking is. Uh, they were originally shooting to have that in January 31st, but there's a conflict, I guess, with something else going on in that time. So the date hasn't been set, uh, the time hasn't been set, uh, but that their interest is in holding that uh, early next year. And so I commit to uh, getting out more details uh, on that round table as when, when they become available. Quick follow up, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that, Mr. Witherell. And, and appreciate your offer to keep the council uh, participants updated on that. But in terms of the public, we might, since the NOAA Office of Marine, National Marine Sanctuaries is, is hosting this event, I anticipate we'd also expect to see communications from them in terms of announcing this broad more broadly for the public we we just often um i just want to make sure it's fairly broadly communicated that this is taking place i would assume that was the intent but i wondered if you discussed that at all in your conversation yep. with yep. the national thank sanctuaries you. office thank you mr chairman ms baker um yes they're very interested in having uh it noticed widely that this is occurring and so I think once the details get nailed down, I'll probably include that in a spotlight on the council's uh, webpage. That, that's my current thinking. And I assume that the region would do something similar. Mr. Kerland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Baker, and, and for interested uh, folks from the public as well, uh, our office has been assisting the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries with uh, contact information for potentially interested stakeholders. So. Um, we have been uh, working closely with them and they have a, a save the date announcement prepared and they just need to fill in the date. So as soon as they have that, it will be going out far and wide. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kurland. Ms. Strapnika. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Witherall. I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, maybe something um, to follow up on, but did notice in your report, um, and you spoke to nominations as plural, um, it was my understanding that the St. George Unangan Heritage proposal, or at least the, the the submitters of that proposal had requested that to be withdrawn and wondering if that is still active and who would be speaking to the details of that in the round table meeting. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Drobnika, I, I don't know the details about the status of that nomination. Uh, the language that I pulled in the executive director's report was from an email that I got from National Marine Sanctuaries about this roundtable. So maybe Mr. Curlin and I can follow up with them and see what their intent is relative to the St. George Sanctuary nomination. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. Um, I, I understand that the roundtable isn't isn't being prepared for the council or council input, but we did have a series of questions that we asked this past June that weren't able to be answered at the time that we were given that presentation. So in addition to Ms. Drobnika's question, I wonder if it's appropriate to kind of remind that if we have council participation, those questions are still outstanding on process and council authority. And that maybe we could just remind that those will likely continue to come up and they could, you know, better prepare for that with this roundtable or future presentations to the council. I'm not asking for a letter or anything, but potentially just an email to remind them of these outstanding questions, including Ms. Drubnika's new question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I've been in regular contact with the folks uh, at the National Marine Sanctuaries and uh, and they really can't provide any more information in response to our letter, uh, but I will certainly follow up uh, in writing when I con contact them relative to the roundtable. Further questions for Mr. Witherall? Okay. All right, that concludes our B1 report. That'll bring us to B2. Good morning, Mr. Keaton. Good morning. Uh, for the record, uh, Josh Keaton, I work for NOAA Fisheries Alaska Regional Office, uh, currently in the position of acting SFARA, which will change soon, as you'll hear later on in the report. Um, so, uh, you know, this is the typical December report. It can be quite large because we um, have a combination of some annual reports, including the amazing in-season management report that Mary will give. So just to help, um, you know, streamline this, uh, I'm just going to go through a brief overview of how I'm going to uh, tackle this large amount of information, and then we'll, we'll proceed through. So I'm going to start with addressing the items in the actual B2 report, um, you know, skipping, uh, the ESA section seven until at the end of that, we'll talk about our staffing changes, move into the ESA section seven report, and then cap us off with that uh, in-season report that I know everybody's looking forward to. So to start us off on the NIMS B2 report, um, you know, we usually give a progress on rulemaking. Um, the comment period for the economic data report revisions closed on December 5th, and a final rule is expected to be published sometime in early 2023. The proposed rule to implement IFQ Omnibus um, published on November 23rd. Comments are invited through January 3rd. And then we have our harvest specifications process, which uh, the Gulf of Alaska published on December 2nd and the Bering Sea harvest specifications should publish sometime this week. Um, I'm gonna go back to you to discuss Amendment 123, one, um, one, um, that's on annual bycatch our halibut ABM. Um, the proposed rule and the final EIS are scheduled to be published in the Federal Register on December 9th. The notice of availability published on November 9th. However, we noticed an error that resulted in the proposed FMP text for Amendment 123 not being available to the public for comment. This error was re remedied immediately on December 2nd. However, we are actively preparing a notice of publication in the Federal Register to extend the comment period to provide the public the full 60 days to review and comment on the proposed FMP amendment. 
All relevant written comments received by the end of the comment period, whether specifically directed um, to the BSA I FMP amendment or the proposed rule will be considered by NIMFS in the approval disapproval decision for amendments one, two, three, and addressed in the response to comments in the final rule. The FEIS will be published on the Alaska Region website, and we will post links to these documents in the Federal Register on the Council E agenda under B2 later this week when these documents publish. Moving on in the B2 report. Um, we have, uh, we received notice from headquarters that they, Ms. Vanderhoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Keaton. Um, I, I apologize if I missed um, on Amendment 122, the trial called rationalization program. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the table um, and I thought we were expecting that proposed rule by the end of November. And so I guess I'm just looking for kind of an update and if we're still on target for implementation in 2024. Um, sure, through the chair, Ms. Vanderhoeven, um, we we know that they are, um, that is actively being worked on. There is a slight delay. I do anticipate that we will see something um, filed relatively soon. I don't have the dates right off the top of my head, but I can get those to you later. We do not anticipate any delay in the implementation of that program as currently scheduled. Okay, um, moving on, we did receive notice from um, headquarters that they um, are uh, looking to or considering initial initiating a review of national standards four, eight, and nine. Um, there were, I think what I understand from that is they're considering um, publishing an advance notice of public rulemaking to gather input from, um, from the public and stakeholders uh, to determine what next steps the agency will provide. So this is just a preliminary notice on where we're at there. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Keaton, for raising that issue. I, I wonder, uh, do you have any information on what prompted that decision or why those particular standards or anything? Uh, a little bit of information and in, um, mostly because of, you know, some of the visits that we had from some of the people in NOAA and hearing from the public. Um, there is uh, an interest to look at, uh, you know, ways to reduce bycatch and other things as I think one of the primary drivers, but uh, being not a decision maker, th that's the only information I know. Thank you. And so in terms of the process, I think what you were able to say is the intention of the agency to publish an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. And so can you remind us, we're used to rulemaking being regulations. Mm -hmm. Why would there be rulemaking for national standards? Can you remind me what that <laughs> process is? Sure. Through the chair, Ms. Baker, this is definitely not an area of my expertise. So um, I I would phone a friend, and but uh, I don't know if I have that access right now. But um, I think at this stage, um, they're, I think they're looking to collect comments on you know, from the public in general before they move towards um, the process. That's what I know. And I'll, I'll look to um, John Curlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so it, essentially a way to look at this is scoping, not in the NEPA context, but uh, the intent is to put out a notice to uh, inform the public of the agency's uh, interest in potentially revising the guidance for these three national standards. As Josh indicated, um, this uh, grew out of um, the administration's interest, uh, partially from uh, feedback that uh, Assistant Administrator Coit heard when uh, she's been visiting with stakeholders in Alaska and other parts of the country uh, in uh, looking closely at the agency's guidance on the national standards, dealing with bycatch, dealing with communities and dealing with allocations. Um, so the intent is to put out the notice to uh, inform potential future action 
which could include uh, a subset of those national standards. It wouldn't necessarily mean updating the guidance on all three. Um, and uh, I, I know the guidelines uh, in the past have been published in the Federal Register. Uh, I, I might look to Mr. Fortenberry here. Uh, it's, it's not a rulemaking per se, but do you want to elaborate on that? Councilor. Thank you, through the chair. Um, yeah, that's correct. So the, um, the MSA requires that the agency publish guidelines for the national standards. Those guidelines do not have the force and effect of law. So they're not rules, but they are published in the Code of Federal Regulations. So all of our guidelines are in the CFRs at 50 CFR 600.310 and following. Um, yeah, so if we amended the guidelines, we would have to publish those amendments uh, as like in a rulemaking essentially, but those guidelines don't have the force and effect of law. Ms. Kimball. Thank you. This was a bit of a surprise. So I'm I'm glad we have an opportunity to ask questions, Mr. Chair. The um they the guidelines don't have the force of law, but they're often referenced in litigation or used as a basis for litigation. And I'm so I'm wondering is for this notice of proposed rulemaking, the agency is looking for feedback on whether to even undertake this process and potential substantive input on how to change the guidelines. Are both of those things in play for this first rule? Uh, through the chair, Ms. Kimball, um, I, I think, it, as I indicated, I think the intent here is scoping. It's to put the put the public on notice that the agency is contemplating revisions to these guidelines and to get input on that and to get input on the direction that the agency might take in revising the guidelines. That's about all I can say on that. Follow up, Mr. Chair, is that your understanding then that this would be a, a lengthy process by which councils would have opportunity since we use the guidelines in order to ensure our actions are consistent with MSA? Is this a something we should be ready to undertake in the next year or is this a longer term process? Mr. Chair, Ms. Kimball, I'm, I'm not aware of a specific timeline that has been charted out for this, um, but uh, it, you know, it's an interest of this administration. So uh, I think that to some degree puts some kind of time context around this, um, but uh, th there's definitely recognition that this has broad implications for all of the eight councils and, and uh, for all of our fisheries. So. Uh, that's why it's it, it's being pursued in a deliberative fashion to get input up front, um, and and there'll be a lot of dialogue and and a lot of process to make sure that that's a very uh, a very thorough uh, opportunity for input uh, to inform whatever direction the agency takes. Thank you. All right, not seeing any further questions. Back to you, Mr. Keaton. Sure, thank you. Um, the next uh, part of the B2 report is the cost recovery free percentages. We usually typically are, um, would publish these in this. Uh, you can see what those values and how they have changed. Um, additionally, there is a GAF report, uh, um, you know, indication attached there. Um, you know, I think the high points on that is that the lease prices for GAF increased substantially in 2022. Um, you know, moving on, we have the 2023 annual deployment plan for observers and electronic monitoring. If you're, um, you remember, um, in order to provide analysts um, working on this task, uh, you know, to focus on some of the cost efficiencies analysis, we're rolling over largely the same plan that we had operated in 2022 under the um, specific selection rates um, that will be operated in 2023 are posted in the report. Um, uh, there's a tribal engagement update. Um, NIMPS um, has been in the process to hire a tribal liaison that will greatly increase our capacity to conduct in effective and meaningful outreach with our tribal partners. Um, I don't know what the timing of when that person would join, but I know it's uh, getting close to that time. And we will inform the council when that person starts and, and everything. On and uh, move on. Uh, as for consultations, NIMS has not engaged in any formal tribal consultations um, since the June 2022 meeting. Um, we did uh, put our tribal engagement newsletter out. Um, 
we, there was a Department of Interior um, slash NOAA consultations that we participated. Actually, while we were at the October Council meeting, these were going on concurrently. We put a little report in there indicating what uh, and who was in attendance there. Um, there is an update on the convention on the conservation and management of Pollock resources in the central Bering Sea or the donut hole convention virtually between November 14th and the 25th. The annual report will be provided to the council as soon as it's available, but it was not available at this time. Um, there's another update on the um, ESA status review for sunflower um, sea stars attached. And then that moves us into personnel changes. Um, I'm going to start with the um, the the people that have left. Uh, we've we've taken three large hits since October and large amounts of um, knowledge leaving as they join go on with different parts of their lives. Um, our deputy and regional administrator Doug Meekum is retiring at the end of December after more than 17 years into the position. I learned recently he. He is the longest serving deputy ARA, and we thank him for everything he's done for us over 17 years, and we wish him well in retirement. Um, additionally, a lot of you know uh, Rebecca Campbell, um, who was our admin assistant in sustainable fisheries ever since I started. She's helped me immensely. I'm so sorry to see her go, but she's also going to move me moving on to retirement at the end of the year. And finally, Jennifer Watson also has accepted a position with the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we wish her well. We know she's very excited for her new job. Um, and, you know, she's been a familiar face here at the council and dealing with um, various issues, particularly in monitoring and scales and stuff like that. So those are um, three transitions that we've had go out. Um, but it's not all bad news because we've hired a new staff. We've uh, picked up Dr. Richard Brenner from the state of Alaska, who will start working from us in January of 2023 as a supervisor for the ecosystem branch, replacing Dr. Anne-Marie Ike, who moved to become the protected resources um, ARA. Uh, he's uh, worked for ADF&G for over 15 years, comes with lots of supervisory experience, along with uh, some direly needed salmon experience. So we're really happy to bring him on board. Um, and this is news that's hot off the press. Um, it's been talked about in the hallways, but there was a selection made for the new SFARA, Miss Gretchen Harrington. And I would like to invite her up to the table. We are extremely happy to have her rejoin Sustainable Fisheries and help lead us. And uh, I'll just turn it over to her. Good morning, Ms. Harrington. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the council. Um, thank you. And I'm excited to work with the council in my new role. Yeah. And we have one final addition. Um, Joel here sitting in the front row, um, we reported to you back in October that we were facing staffing changes and we were looking at different ways in which to address that. One of those programs available is what's called the Lantern Program, which allows us to kind of borrow among within the agency and allow people to get some experience. So Joel works for the Observer Program as a debriefer. He's going to be coming over and helping me in the monitoring branch do VMPs and stuff. And I think he starts this week. And so we're welcoming him into the um, council process. And um, so I just wanted to welcome him. Thank you, Mr. Keaton and welcome. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I really do have a question, but I wanna start out uh, by thanking you, Josh, uh, for acting over the past few months and, and while continuing uh, some of the regular work you've done in support of this council process. And I wanted to congratulate Ms. Harrington on her new position. Um, I've worked with you for many years, and so I look forward to continuing. Uh, but I really do have a question, like I said, Mr. Chair. Mr. Keaton, I'm sorry, I'm a little slow. Uh, in the beginning of your, your primary B2 report, uh, when you, if you review this, I apologize. Uh, there is a note that due to unexpected changes in staffing resources in your division, the earliest possible implementation of uh, the trawl EM action uh, would be January 2025. And I think that was different than what we were expecting. And can you just confirm for me? I'm not recalling when we took final action, what our expected timing was. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Baker, through the chair. Um, you know, this is the one thing that I wanted to make sure I said, and the one thing I skipped. Um, and something very important, as you all know, in my involvement with Trollium. So yes, we did have some unexpected state changes from the October meeting to now, which has caused us to take a harder look at what our timeline is for Trollium. And as a result, uh, trying to meet a 2024 implementation date um, is not possible at this time. Um, and, uh, you know, we will, we will try to streamline this as much as possible, but, uh, we know that we would not be ready for 2024. So we're setting the timeline to 2025 and we're working on various ways to, um, look for funding solutions to bridge us, give us that bridge gap. And, uh, um, there may be, uh, I think part of that would be maybe a request from the council to write a letter to ask what those resources may be. Thank you for that, Mr. Keaton. And, and just to clarify, it, it was uh, the, the council's understanding that because uh, the Troll EM uh, program had been operating under an exempted fishing permit for multiple years that required uh, sort of funding to put in place that uh, the action that we took that would we expected would be in place by January 2024 would would negate the need for additional funding to continue under an EFP. Therefore, the bridge funding that you were talking about uh, would be in response to the fact that we're not going to have the trolley and program for another year. And so another year of funding is needed before we get to that regulated program. I'm probably not explaining it exactly right, but I just want to be clear for those of us that haven't tracked that process as closely. Um, through the chair, Ms. Baker, you, you got most of it correct. Um, we are operating under an EFP and therefore we are using NIFWIF funds currently to support that program. I would also mention that uh, as we, you know, even though this is a delay, we do not anticipate this to impact the vessels that are currently using EM. We're looking for those funding sources. We have a few ideas, um, you know, to keep this program going forward with no lapse in those that are participating because we also benefit from it greatly in the increased data quality, it would be more problematic to try to stop and start. Um, there's a lot of different reasons. So that's why we are um, communicating this now, communicating this early to give us the time to be able to figure out and make sure that there's no issues going forward. Okay. Ms. Kimball. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Follow up on the request or suggestion that the council write a letter. The suggestion is not that we ask the, the PIs or others that have been working on this project to go back to NIFWIF and ask for a 2024 bridge funding through NIFWIF. Is there an opportunity through NOAA funding that you're asking us to highlight for the agency that other regions have used that we could put in a letter? Please explain that a little bit more or whether there's some burden on the PIs that they should be aware of. Um, through the chair, Ms. Kimball, yes, there, there's a lot of um, monies. I, we know that uh, our Senator Lisa Murkowski has, you know, pushed hard to provide us with uh, um, monies for electronic monitoring to, to bring us across. Um, we, you know, there, there are various pots of money that uh, is for bridging these gaps and other regions have taken advantage of those. And so what we're asking is to just figure out where, what those pots of monies are and, you know, express our interest in being included in them. Uh, and you specifically with our um, Senator doing such a great job getting us access to electronic monitoring monies in the budgeting process. Mr. Twait. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I'm not sure I actually have a, um, a question, although I'm gonna certainly be interested in input. Um, from the agency on this, but it, it sounds to me as if uh, at this point, um, first off, the council should recognize and, and express appreciation to the region for um, suggesting, uh, a, at least from a standpoint of continuing implementation of the program, that extension of the EFP for uh, at least a year, if not longer, in order to accommodate this um, 
so that on the water we have continuity of of what's turning out to be a, a, a very beneficial and important program uh, I, I think that's we should sort of acknowledge the agency's commitment there um, I, I think as well that it does make sense to me at this point that um, the council should consider a, a letter from you to um, headquarters just noting that this unfortunate circumstance has come up, acknowledging both the agency's commitment as well as the council's very strong interest in ensuring that, that while we wait for the ability to make this a regulated program, we maintain the ability to actually have the program operating on the water, noting that that means essentially another year of bridge funding and requesting um, the agency's assistance in helping find that and in particular inquiring about some of the sources of funding that we're aware of that have been so far by the agency directed towards bridge funding nationally. Uh, and um, I, I think a letter like that could be crafted pretty quickly and, and, and get that out. But at, at least as one council member, it makes a lot of sense to me, but I'm also looking at Mr. Keaton and others in the agency to see if that type of a letter is, is, likely to, to be successful. Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Twight. We certainly appreciate any support from the council in that regard. Um, a, a factor here was uh, we were actually on the verge of bringing somebody on board, uh, another reg writer to assist specifically with this program, uh, had extended a job offer and then the person unexpectedly declined just before starting. And we just don't have a lot of depth on the bench right now. So. Uh, given the length of the hiring process, when something like that happens, it's a real setback for us. Um, so uh, understand the interest in continuing to run this program through the EFP, if possible, in the interim. Uh, and uh, we will do our best to get appropriate resources to help with that. And um, any support from the council would be appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Kerland. Okay, we can um, discuss the letter a little bit later in the agenda then. Anything further, uh, Mr. Twight? On, on a different subject, um, relative to the, um, the Donut Hole Convention, uh, several um, in conjunction with um, this year's um, virtual meeting, several of the US domestic advisors had expressed some interest in um, having commerce and state uh, um, convene a, a, a um, meeting of the Bering Sea Fishery Advisors, um, the, the BISFAB, and I'm just wondering where those plans lie at this point. Um, I understand it's too late for um, the, uh, and, and really wasn't requested in the context of this year's Donut Hole, more in terms of looking forward, both in terms of what's the future of BISFAB but as well trying to get an update on and an understanding of um, where things may lie relative to our relationship with Russia in particular. Um, and that I haven't heard anything more about that request. I'm wondering if Commerce has any information or if, if um, Mr. Moore at State has any information on the status of that. Um, through, the through the chair, uh, um, Mr. Twight, uh, I do not have any of the additional information on that readily available at this time, but I will look during the break to get that information for you and get that to you. Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you uh, to the chair. Um, thanks for the question. Um, just to set the context and particularly for members of the public who may not be aware. Mr. Moore, can, can you get a little closer to your mic, please? Sorry. Thank you. Um, Thanks for the question. Um, just for a little bit of background in case members of the public aren't familiar with some of this. Um, so we have the US-Russia Intergovernmental Consultative Committee, the ICC, um, which is a bilateral um, diplomatic dialogue that takes place between the United States and Russia. Um, it had been taking place generally once a year. Um, linked to the ICC is the North Pacific and Bering Seas Fishery Advisory Board, or the BISFAB, um, which is a body established by statute to provide advice and guidance to the U.S. representatives 
um, to the ICC on fisheries. So the future of the ICC is unclear at this uh, point due to the current geopolitics. The State Dep Department and NOAA are discussing options for a path forward. Uh, we recognize the value of dialogue with Russia on fisheries issues and hope that resuming such discussions can be something we can work toward at a future point. In the interim, we continue to rely on input from stakeholders and welcome continued communications uh, with those of you engaged on issues related uh, to Russia. And so uh, I welcome the views and perspectives of council members, of members of the public on this. But at this point, this is really what I have to share on this. Thanks. Mr. Twight. Um, thank you, Mr. Moore. I think it's safe to say that at least several of the BISFAB members have, have expressed real uh, interest in, in an actual session to to, uh, and understand there's a huge amount of uncertainty, um, but also want to make sure that state in particular understands that as we experience the northward shifting of stocks, a lot of concern about um, uh, increased potential for Russian interactions with stocks that up until now have been predominantly U.S. Um, stocks that have been largely able to be managed within just U.S. waters. And and so it's one of those very unfortunate things that as the relationship deteriorates, the need for the relationship is probably increasing. And, and I, I think that's of real interest in making sure that state understands that. Thank you for that through the chair. Um, yeah, noted. And we'll definitely um, keep that perspective in mind as we work on a path forward. Okay, All right. any further questions? All right. Mr. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have a couple more items to do. The first um, coming up is uh, a short discussion on the ESA Section 7. I'd like to invite Dr. Anne-Marie Ike up to the table as our protected resources ARA, um, you know, largely because we are we are striving to be in a cooperative environment and communicate regularly. Um, so uh, is there the presentation getting loaded? I think there is. And we can just stand by for that. Um, and Dr. Ike, whenever that comes up, uh, please proceed and good morning. All right. It looks like it's up. So, um, you know, the Alaska region is reinitiating ESA Section 7 consultation to evaluate the effects of the GOA and Bering Sea groundfish fisheries on ESA listed species and designated critical habitat. Um, ESA Section 7 consultations are routine analyses conducted by NIMPS and other federal agencies. Um, most people may be more familiar with these consultations as they've heard about them under mining, gas, or construction project lens. However, these consultations are also done for federal fisheries. But since it's been a while since we've done one for ground fish FMP, we felt it prudent to just give a brief overview of the process. Section seven of the ESA requires federal agencies to promote the conservation purposes of the ESA and to consult with US Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMPS as appropriate to ensure the effects of the action they authorize, fund, or carry out are not likely to jeopardize the continued existence of a listed species. As a result, any major project that has a federal nexus must consult on that action if ESA listed species or their critical habitat may be affected by the action. NIMS has jurisdiction over marine species that are considered endangered or threatened under the ESA, including marine mammals. In the Alaska region, this includes 13 species or distinct population seg segments, what you typically hear as DPS, um, of cetaceans, which are your dolphins, porpoises, and whales, or your pinnipeds, your seals, and sea lions. In Alaska, walrus, sea otters, polar bears, and seabirds fall under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, so uh, 
Um, why we are consulting, um, it's basically because NIMS continues to examine federal fisheries for compliance with ESA Section 7 as part of our normal duties. The GOA and BSAI fisheries have met several triggers for reinitiation, and therefore, because that has happened, it is mandated by federal law. So the reinitiation triggers, just to bring you up to speed on what those may be, um, you know, they, it, a reinitiation trigger may result from an amount of an authorized incidental take is being exceeded. Um, it can also be if new information reveals effects of agency action may affect the listed species or critical habitat in a matter or to the extent not previously considered. Um, another uh, reason to get a reinitiation trigger is modifications to the action that may affect listed species or critical habitat in a matter to the extent that has not been previously considered and then um, whether there's new species or new critical habitat listings um, for the triggers that we have met uh, first there's newly designated critical habitat for humpback whales and ringed and bearded seals Another trigger that has been met is the incidental take statements or ITSs um, were exceeded for stellar sea lions and sperm whales. I will note that overall the level of observed takes has been relatively low and estimated overages of the ITS have also been relatively uh, low. We will evaluate this closely in the new consultations. Um, a third uh, trigger was where we there were designated humpback whale distinct population segments that have now been listed, two of which occur in Alaska. And I'll note that at this point, we are unaware of any particular new information that suggests the Alaska ground fish fisheries have population level effects on ESA listed species or critical habitats, other than those already considered in previous consultations. Um, so just to bring you up to speed on the consultation process, um, NIMPS uh, Sustainable Fisheries Division will um, conduct an initial analysis. That's what we call the biological assessment. Once that's done, it's uh, handed over to NIMPS PRD that will take that biological assessment and evaluate the effects of, of the action to ESA species. And that's what we commonly use the term biological opinion. Um, the consultation will be on the current and status quo fisheries. So basically how the fisheries are operating now. Um, NIMS plans, plans to complete one consultation for the GOA groundfish FMP and another for the Bering Sea groundfish FMP. This is because NIMS does not have the staff resources to move both consultations along at the same time. However, we do note that there are data needs and background information for each consultation that will overlap in part, which um, we think will increase some of the efficiency. Um, currently, the anticipated timeline is for um, SFD to start with the Gulf of Alaska, as I mentioned, um, that work is already currently underway on the biological assessment part. And then uh, we will move, once that's completed, we will move into the Bering Sea, and likely in 2024. Um, NIPS plans to keep the council, tribal partners, and the public appraised of the progress made on these consultations. Um, this is the first step in making sure that we keep you informed um, throughout this process. And uh, with that, uh, we could take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Keaton. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, thanks for the presentation. I am less familiar, I guess, with this process and I don't know if it's a question for Mr. Keaton or Mr. Curlin, but I have two questions. And one is just on the, the scope of this and whether it really is just looking at status quo fisheries on ESA listed species and critical habitat and and bringing forward our current um what did you say josh authorized incidental take amounts or whether this process with the inclusion of new trends in these species has an opportunity to, to modify those incidental take amounts i don't know what the scope is um for the opportunities for change in our level of interaction that's authorized under the current consultation dr Ike. Thank you. Um, through the chair, for the record, I'm Amory Ike with National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, so, through the chair, Ms. Kimball, um, through this process, 
the um, protected resources when they're developing the biological opinion will look at the the take that's estimated to occur um, through the prosecution of the groundfish fisheries. And that can modify the incidental take statements that result from, from this. But it, we are evaluating, to get to your initial question, we are evaluating the status quo fisheries as they exist now under their existing management regimes. If you allow me to just repeat what I think you said, Emory, is so that incidental take amounts could change up or down based on new population trends that we might see with listed species. That's a, that's a possibility. Correct. And then my sec, oh, that now it's my third question, would be uh, maybe to, to Mr. Curlin about how, if there's anything additional the agency can provide on kind of our, our opportunity to staff uh, this with our current capacity and, and still continue to provide, you know, input and engagement with council actions that we keep pushing through this process. I think there's a little bit of concern because it seems like a big undertaking um, for a couple different divisions. And if there's anything you can share with the council about how much time this will take or what staff might be involved. And if that's not an appropriate question outside of executive session, I, I understand. Uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Kimball, thanks for the question. Um, I, I don't I don't think I can give you very precise answers to that other than it is a big undertaking, uh, but one that, as uh, Mr. Keaton and Ms. Ike indicated, we've determined is necessary to ensure continued compliance of the fisheries with the Endangered Species Act. Um, so it's, it's big. It's going to take us a couple of years to get through this. Um, as Mr. Keaton indicated, we're going to start with the Gulf of Alaska FMP and then move to the Bering Sea FMP. Um, as he indicated, there are some efficiencies there. There's some, some information that can be used for both. Um, this is a challenge, uh, but it, it's something that we felt is necessary at this time uh, to ensure continued compliance with the Endangered Species Act. Mr. Twait. Okay. Yep. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that response, Mr. Curlin, I I wonder, uh, so during uh, Mr. Keaton's presentation, uh, he noted that NIMS plans to keep the council uh, informed in terms of progress made on the consultations, but I guess I'm just putting this out there for consideration following on Ms. Kimball's question. Can we also think about uh, the impact of these consultations on NIMS staff as we move through potential council actions. And I'm not sure of the plan to keep the council apprised of the progress, whether it's in a B report like this, or um, have you, I don't know, have you, I would just encourage you, maybe that's not a question. <laughs> have you thought about different ways that uh, we could think about, We could you could keep the council apprised, both of sort of the substance and progress on the consultations themselves and what that means in terms of what the council's looking at if we're thinking about taking a final action, for example. Can we have those conversations at that time? Will that be possible? I know you can't do it right now, but maybe then. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Ms. Baker, thanks. Um, we absolutely will will try to keep this an open and continuing dialogue. Um, I think during these B reports is, is a good time to provide regular status updates. Um, if there are emergent issues that uh, we feel like need to be brought to the council's attention uh, in between council meetings, of course, we will do that as well. And yes, we will uh, speak to the work workload implications as the council is contemplating uh, actions to take while these consultations are underway. Mr. Dwight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Curlin, sort of continuing along this line, of discussion um, regarding priorities and timing. Um, I'm still struggling to understand the impact of this. Um, and, and in particular, I'm wondering about one impact uh, that we've been having a lot of discussion around the council table and, and with stakeholders about um, the importance of uh, taking a hard look at our programmatic SEIS and potentially revising that. 
And one of the contexts for that discussion has been an expectation that I've certainly heard expressed by stakeholders, and I think some council members share, that as we go through that process, that will end up being resulting in potentially some fairly significant changes in how we do business as we continue the transition towards ecosystem-based fishery management um, that the SEIS set us on. And so I, I'm trying to weigh this, the agency's decision that there's a need to, to re-examine status quo in a state of, in, in a um, ESA context with a sense that within a, a fairly short period of time in terms of years, status quo may not be all that relevant. Uh, and and it will probably have to re go through the whole reconsultation process as a result of a re-examination of the um, programmatic and where that leads us as a council. So I, I, from where I sit, it kind of looks like a lot of staff time and effort now going into a process to examine status quo when we're not sure how much longer status quo is really going to work for us. Um, and, and yet, it, to sort of pile on to my question, um, it, it seems that the resources going into this may well uh, delay our ability to re-examine the programmatic and begin to as a council, as a, as the stakeholders, examine how we're going to confront, in particular, the challenges of climate change. What kinds of tools we're going to be adapting to that, and how that would sort of change how we do business as well. So it feels like we're choosing, or the agency, really for us, is choosing a somewhat reactive action at this point instead of. Um, facilitating a proactive approach to the challenges that we've got ahead of us. And it is a question, and, and I, the basic question that I'm asking you to give me a context to is, why does that make sense? Why does the agency's choice to devote the resources that this is gonna require in this matter make sense at this point when it's gonna delay, at least in my judgment, our ability to proact, to try to, get ahead of some of the challenges that we're facing. Mr. Kerland. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Twight, um, thanks for the question. I'm fully committed to supporting the council in trying to be more proactive in response to climate change. Uh, we are facing a situation where the fisheries are, are never static. There are always changes in our management process, some incremental, uh, potentially some that are more uh, transformative in, in the future. Um, as to how we would approach things. Um, I'm also mindful that in my role, um, I need to make sure that the agency is in compliance with all applicable law. Um, and that's an agency responsibility. And we need to ensure that the fisheries remain in compliance with the Endangered Species Act um, as we are progressing. Um, the kinds of changes that you're referring to are likely multi-year changes. Uh, multi-year processes to develop new approaches uh, to consider uh, potential new new paradigms for how we are approaching fishery management. Um, in the meantime, we need to stay in compliance with the law. And um, I've, I've gotten this question a number of times about, you know, why now? Um, and uh, I think Mr. Keaton and Ms. Ike uh, tried to go through that in terms of the triggers that we have hit. Um, in uh, exceeding the authorized levels of take, in having new uh, endangered and threatened species listings, in having new critical habitat designations, and in needing to generally update the information regarding um, status and trends of listed species and what's known about their interactions uh, with fisheries. Um, so uh, we really can't wait. Um, and um, and and need to make sure that these consultations are brought up to date. Um, I, I'm you know frankly I would be concerned about potential vulnerability to legal challenges if we did not update these consultations. 
Um, so that's why we are reinitiating now. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that um, I understand that my decision to make this a priority for the agency has workload implications for the council. I recognize that. Um, those are difficult and unfortunate trade-offs, but uh, it's something that we had to do. Mr. Twight. Uh, thanks, Mr. Kerland. I... So we can't have it all. We can't do both at the same time. That's become abundantly clear. Um, again, just reminded of that again at this meeting with the unfortunate delay in the um, in the, the EM um, rulemaking, uh, and and we're, we're acutely aware of the the um, the limitations of current staff resources, and and that's nobody's fault, but. But I, I was kind of hearing in your response a little bit of a, we'd like to have it all, but we can't. So in choosing this, at least from your viewpoint, how, how do we navigate handling this situation, but also from your perspective, when, when can we think about some of these other initiatives that the council has talked about as a priority? But in in making this sort of unilaterally, I, I'm left sort of asking you um, from your chair, what's when are things when are when is this process going to be far enough down the road that we can start thinking about other things? Because I view this as fairly all consuming. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Twight, I would not characterize this as all consuming. It's a big undertaking for sure. It, it, it's going to take some significant resources from our sustainable fisheries staff, from our protected resources staff, from our general counsel advisors, et cetera. Um, but it's not all consuming. It's not like everything screeches to a halt for two years while we do these consultations. Um, life's go, life goes on. We're gonna continue to manage the fisheries in season. We're gonna continue to work with the council on uh, rulemakings as best we can with available staff resources uh, as we're going forward while we're completing these consultations. It is a follow-up. So, I, and, but in particular, the programmatic SEIS, which I I know we'd already talked about. At present, we don't have the resources collectively between the agency and the council, and so the council suggested sort of a path forward where, for at least the initial stages, would be done primarily by council staff. How much further out does this particular decision put the ability of sustainable fisheries, in particular at the agency? How, how much how much delay does that introduce? Do you have a sense of that? Uh, frankly, I'm not sure I follow the question. Uh, we, you know, we we had some discussion around the council table about um, about uh, initiating work towards a new programmatic EIS. Uh, Mr. Witherell indicated that council staff would uh, take the lead on the first phases of that. Um, and, um, you know, certainly in, in consultation with our staff. Um, so it, it's definitely on our planning horizon uh, for um, work maybe a year plus out, shifting more towards us. Uh, and I guess the best I can say is we will do our best. Um, you know, again, I don't, uh, we're not, we're not going to be devoting 100% of our staff resources to ESA consultations. It's a big lift, but it's not going to be all we do. Mr. Mizzaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Curlin, for your comments. I, I guess I understand why these are all necessary, and I appreciate the exchange you had with Mr. Twight, but I also feel like the nature of this discussion that just occurred could be deeply disturbing to some stakeholders and other users of the resource that have real pressing disastrous issues. And I guess it would be helpful to hear from you that you feel like you, despite undertaking these uh, endeavors, feel like you still have enough staff available to at least move the most critical issues coming before this council through the regulatory process at a normal pace. And if you don't, maybe we should let those people that are counting on this council to take action in the next few meetings to know that they should prepare themselves for a slower than normal process, which is already slow in their eyes. I guess that's 
my concern is that this discussion may be sending a message to stakeholders on the phone and in the audience that are counting on the council to take some action to address their problems. Thanks. Mr. Chair, Mr. Misro, we, we had a lot of discussion around this at the last council meeting about priorities. Um, and, you know, at that time, I wasn't prepared to share with you all that we we're contemplating reinitiating the Section 7 consultations, but it was definitely at the forefront of my mind. Um, there are workload implications. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, as for consequences for the fisheries and for stakeholders, well, you know, candidly, if we ignore compliance with the Endangered Species Act and we get uh, legal challenges on that, uh, the, the worst case scenario is an injunction to stop the fisheries for failure to comply with the Endangered Species Act, and none of us wants that. Um, so the intent is to ensure that we uh, continue to comply with the ESA and other applicable law, and it's going to require difficult workload balancing, and uh, we're, we're committed to manage that as best we can to continue to make progress on, on the Council's priorities uh, consistent with uh, with our overall workload and, and balancing things and trying to get input from you all about what the relative priority of different tasks are uh, consistent with our available staff resources. Ms. Kimball, I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Keaton. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanna provide some support to um, Mr. Kerland here, you know, as he stated, we we put a lot of planning into this, right? We we're also making progress in hiring our staff or, you know, new staff to fill some of those holes. Um, I see positive impacts here. There was a lot of planning that was went in to identify which staff and where they that might meet the priorities. So I just want to give a little bit of comfort here that that was well thought of, particularly in in light of all the various uh, projects that are or you know, initiatives that the council might do in the near future. Um, this is not all encompassing. This is including like a team of people. And this is why I wanted uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Ike up at the table. You know, we're, we're, we're communicating, we're planning, we're cooperating to ensure that the council can continue to do their business while we undertake this task. And I, I hope that helps. Ms. Kimball. Thank you. I, I'm trying not to beat a dead horse, but I just wanted to emphasize that one of the improvements that the agency came to us with several years ago was, you know, not just the council taking final action and ensuring there was staffing available at, at NIMS to then write the rule, but that there were NIMS staff available prior to final action to ensure that we weren't missing something specifically around monitoring or enforcement or anything that affected catch accounting. And I'm, I'm, I guess I just want to emphasize that this is not a question that if we're going to lose that opportunity for that early involvement, that just extends the process because we most likely haven't captured everything that we need to prior to writing a rule and then the agency needs to come back to us. So anytime I think when we're going through an action as early as possible that the agency can identify, we have not had staff review this or we haven't had the level of monitoring or enforcement engagement in this section. I think that would be very helpful to the council to understand whether we need to slow the roll on that particular action to allow for that engagement prior to final action, or whether we feel comfortable enough proceeding and having the agency do a full review at the rule and making stage. So I just wanted to be really specific about identifying that opportunity early. Um, it, it, maybe we can mitigate some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Any further questions or points before we move on? Okay, I think we stretched the MACE rules a little bit on, on this agenda item, but I think um, that was important to do uh, for the for the process. So uh, thank you, Dr. Ike and Mr. Keaton. Um, so that would end my part of the B2 reports. And at this point, I'd like to pass it over to our in-season management staff to give the in-season management report. Okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Keaton. And good morning, Ms. Farunas and uh, Mr. Whitney. I suspect that we're going to wind up taking a break uh, at some time in the in the middle of these presentations. So, uh, sometime around ten, if it's uh, if you're feeling a natural uh, break point. Okay, Just great. Feel free to um, yeah, we we'll, we can break any at any point. Okay. 
really. And we're just waiting to bring up the presentation. We'll start out with the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. Um, this is a 2022 review of the annual um, groundfish fisheries in, for the federal fisheries. That'll be coming up here in just a minute. It's a big report, so it might take a little yes. get loaded. I'm not quite hearing that. Might need oh. to pull the mic a little bit. It's a large report, so it might take a little bit. Oh, to sure. Load okay. up here. But I'll just. We um, might need a brief two seconds stand down here. Okay. Well, maybe it would make sense to just uh, take our, our morning break and then we'll come back and uh, uh, take the, the management report. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, um, let's see. It's uh, 9.45, let's uh, come back around 10, maybe a little bit past that, but uh, take our morning break. Is it just because we get the PowerPoint? You can just have to use our PowerPoint. Yeah, we can. I mean, it just isn't like something. Is your document the one that you sent us by PDF the exact same as one you're using? I wanted to bring it Then you can just present from your computer if you want to log in to Zoom and do it that way. Yeah, that'd be easier for you.
that's Thank you. 